morning, friends, and happy Friday. This is Jen Espinosa Goswami coming to you live to talk about how to get a good night's sleep. And um, this is a topic that finished our January theme for the month, which is getting more rest. I feel that resolution. So I thought it was helpful to talk about different ways we can rest throughout this month. So this is our final live stream for this month. And next month, we're going to be talking all about self love and what that looks like and how to really embrace yourself no matter what your previous experience was with uh, your health goals your skin and today we're going to talk all about ways to improve and increase your self love next month throughout the course of february but let's talk about today before we jump into how to get a good night's sleep I would like to hear from you because it's 10 degrees here in Minneapolis and that's why I'm wearing this thing besides the fact it's not a good hair day right now because I haven't showered yet so keeping it real <laughs> not only my cold but you don't want to see what's underneath this headscarf right now because it's uh it's really cold and I just I'm I obviously don't have makeup on and I had a presentation last night so while I slept well I just, um, it's been a hectic morning so far, so I'm embracing that, and I'm embracing the fact that I've already walked my dog in this nasty cold, so I'm very excited to see what else happens today, including cozying up on my couch and taking care of business things. So I'm curious to hear from you if you're joining us live or on the replay. Either one counts. You still showed up. I'd like to hear from you. What temperature is it where you live? And you can share the temperature and where you live because I'd be curious to hear who's seeing these videos, who um, is experiencing drastic temperatures like I am, and who wants to, um, who's chiming in on these videos because I love seeing who's joining me and where they're joining me from. The beauty of and having a page is that I can go international this way. So, um, by the way, it is cold enough here in Minneapolis that even though I I registered and paid for a 5k tomorrow morning in St. Paul. It's called the Securian Financial Run. It's actually, I never run in St. Paul. I live on the west side of the city, so I almost never make it to St. Paul. A lot of my mom friends were running, and I'm like, oh, it's, it's only a 5k. I've been consistently running 5k since I completed my half marathon. So in terms of mileage, I'm like, oh, I can totally do it. I was a little nervous about temperature because who knows, January is kind of a an iffy thing in terms of temperature. We don't necessarily know what January is going to look like. And unfortunately, tomorrow is going to be a negative temperatures and it's an outdoor run. So I am bailing on my outdoor run tomorrow, which will help me get more rest because <laughs> I probably wouldn't be able to sleep tonight if I knew that I had to wake up and run you know, 3.1 miles or 3.2 miles in negative five degree temperatures. That's insane. My husband was concerned I'd get frostbite and things like that. So I'm like, I'm bailing. That's okay. I paid for the registration fee. I got my swag. I'm good to go. I'm not going to go show up at this race. I'm going to just exercise in my home where it's nice and warm and where I can, you know, go longer, stronger, faster inside the house because I'm not hard. <laughs> So uh, I'm okay with that decision, and I'm actually pretty excited because I get to spend more time with my family at home and not feel crazy cold by the time I get back from <laughs> an outdoor run. I can keep nice and warm inside my house while my kids are playing in the same space. So I'm very excited about the weekend coming up. But let's talk about, because the weekend is coming up, you might be like, oh, finally I get to catch up on sleep. And I hear from a lot of clients and people that I work with or people that I connect with on a phone call that they don't get a good night's sleep. Um, first of all, let's put it out there that while we know intuitively and from research studies that the average person benefits from at least eight hours of sleep a night, that is not realistic for all of us. So if you care to weigh in on this discussion and see where everyone who's watching this falls on the spectrum, because I always like to know more about you, how many hours of sleep do you average per night? So just pop your number down below. I would say that I average a good eight hours per night, and that's probably my minimum in order to function well. 
So um, some people can function really well on five or six hours of sleep a night, which is approximately the average for the United States. So if you're falling in that range, you're about average for this country. If you're outside of this country, I'd be curious to hear where you fall because you may be you know, above or below that average. And I feel that the United States doesn't prioritize sleep the way some other cultures do. My husband's from India, and I feel like they prioritize sleep more. Not necessarily sleeping at night, but they prioritize naps. It's kind of a napping culture. Like rest is a very important piece of it. And I feel that many other cultures are more friendly to getting rest, whether that's more sleep at night or siestas in the afternoon or naps or what have you. So I'm curious to hear from you. On a typical night, there, of course, you know, and we're not talking about catching up on weekends. We're not talking about nap time. But on average, how many hours of sleep do you get per night? And if you choose to weigh in on that, does that feel restful to you? Does that feel like the right amount of hours for you? Because it may not, but it may be what you have to do with this stage of life. And when I say stage of life, I'm referring to moms out there. If you have a young one who's under three years old, it could be that you can't get sleep at night because your child keeps waking you up. And that's kind of the stage of life. And I say under three because some kids tend to crawl out of bed and crawl into your bed, which can interrupt your sleep as well. So if you're in that stage of life, I am no longer in that stage of life. So I do have the luxury of getting uninterrupted sleep at night. Unless my dog has an issue or a concern in the middle of the night, she, she sleeps very lightly. So she might, you know, move from my daughter's bed to my bed. And sometimes that wakes me up and I fall right back asleep. So if that's your stage of life where you're like, I get five or six hours a night, it's not enough sleep for me. And that's just what I have to do because I have to wake up for the children. I have to wake up for the pets. I have to wake up for whatever. I feel for you and this may be informational for you but may not be the best use of your time right now but make sure you watch the replay <laughs> because if that's your stage of life it, it will pass with time but you may not be there quite yet you might want to check out one of the other live streams I did in terms of napping better and the importance of rest and how you can tell you're not getting enough rest you probably already know that so I mentioned that I average about eight hours of sleep a night and typically I sleep very well. However, recently I've been waking up because of allergies and that's not something I can control. I am seeing an allergist, I am doing inhalers, I am doing everything in terms of, I spent two years troubleshooting how to get a good night's sleep with allergies. So if you have other concerns, medical or otherwise, that keep you up at night, I feel for you and I also sympathize with you because I have had those experiences as well. And there is a solution. So if you're still struggling with finding a solution of sleeping continuously throughout the night, this is for you. <laughs> so first of all, because I'm, you know, I'm a health coach and I talk about food a lot, there are certain foods that you can eat before bed that make it harder for you to sleep. You may have heard of some of these foods. You may be currently eating some of these foods before you go to sleep. Um, they're not helping you, but I can share some foods that will help you. So the studies say that if you eat a high pro a high fat snack before bedtime, within half an hour, an hour of bed, you probably will struggle with calming your stomach down. It takes your stomach a little bit of time. It takes time to get to the stomach for one thing, but it also takes your stomach a bit of time to digest. And high fat foods tend to take more work from your digestive system. So high fat foods might be fried, anything fried, um, a really juicy piece of steak, things like that. So if you're a person who tends to push your dinner time until just before bed, um, then you might be struggling with sleeping at night because your, your stomach is doing the work of digestion, which takes energy. And when you're ready to go to sleep, you should be ready to calm all of your systems down in your body your nervous system, your digestive system, whatever systems you can, your circulatory system. This is you preparing for a pleasant night's sleep. And if your stomach is working overtime while you're trying to go to sleep, it might interrupt your ability to sleep comfortably. So high fat snacks are also not encouraged like pork rinds. Don't eat pork rinds right before you go to bed. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Um, there are healthier fats that might be okay in small amounts and best if you combine them with a source of carbs. So for example, if you're like on a keto 
plan right now and you eat avocado all the time, maybe you're hungry at night. So you're like, I'm going to have a half an avocado. That's fine. But again, yeah, it's requiring your stomach to do some work just at the same time of night that you're trying to calm down and relax. So it might interfere with that. If you combine it with something else like a carb, it might be a little easier on your stomach because it, it processes it differently if you combine it with another macronutrient. But again, if you can make it uh, more than an hour before you lay your head down to sleep, that at least gives your stomach time to process through what you ate. So that's step number one. Be cautious of when you eat and what types of food you eat before you go to bed. And again, this is within the hour before you lay your head down on your pillow. What are you eating before bed? Many of us tend to gravitate towards carbs at night, especially for someone who's been up a long time during the day. And a lot of the snacky kinds of items that tempt us in the evening hours tend to be carbs like popcorn and chips and cookies and candy. Again, it's not a good idea to load up on any sort of food within an hour of going to bed. The high carb snacks might make you sleepy enough unless it's loaded with sugar. But again, if you can avoid eating within the hour before bed, that's great. If you do find yourself having a late dinner, then give yourself some time to kind of relax after that. Um, you might push your bedtime a little back in order to make it a more peaceful night for you when you are able to go to sleep. Just curious from those who are watching this, what time do you typically eat dinner? For me, it's not a concern to interrupt my sleep because I eat dinner at five or six o'clock in the evening. And I don't always snack, but if I do, it's done by 8.30. I'm in bed by 9.30 or 10, so it works out for me. But some people have different schedules than I do, so I'm curious to hear from you what your schedule looks like for dinner and if you snack. Uh, thing number two that we're going to talk about is alcohol. Yes, I know. It's Friday today. Happy hour is coming up. Aren't we excited about that? If you drink more than one glass of wine at night or more than one beer at night, it might be interrupting not just your overall sleep, but it might be interrupting your REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement. That's where you really recharge your brain and refresh, is through REM sleep. Now you may have heard that we have different sleep cycles and we are constantly cycling through the different stages of sleep over the course of however many hours we're sleeping. So if you sleep a shorter period of time, you're shortchanging some of those cycles of sleep. And if you're shortchanging the REM part of your sleep, it's even worse for you because that's when your brain really recharges and refreshes. Another reason why it's important to get a certain number of hours of sleep because you don't, you want to go through the complete sleep cycle. And if you're not able to, or you interrupt that cycle, you won't feel like you're ready to wake up. You won't feel um, as excited. You won't feel energized. You'll be uh, sluggish. You'll be, they call it sleep inertia. Anytime you interrupt your sleep cycles, it's not a good thing. And no matter how long it takes you to fall asleep, we all go through the same sleep cycles and they're approximately the same amount of time. So just wanted to throw that out there. But alcohol, has an interesting effect on our body. So maybe you feel like it makes you tired and makes it easier for you to fall asleep. That's great. But you're more likely to wake up in the middle of the night, which is not restful sleep. And it's also more likely to interfere with your REM sleep, which if you can avoid interfering with your REM sleep at any cost, you should, because that's how you get a more restful night's sleep. Curious to hear from you. So I don't usually drink and a lot of the clients I work with don't tend to drink either. So this may not be a concern for them. But alcohol, so you know, you're like, well, I don't drink alcohol, that's great. But you might be drinking some other things at night that are also keeping you awake. So let's talk about some of those other things that you might be drinking before bed that are interfering with your sleep. Anything with caffeine, soda, coffee, tea. Some of us are more sensitive to caffeine than others. If you're a person who literally needs like four cups of coffee every morning to get going, then maybe you're not as sensitive to caffeine, but it's always a good idea to taper off your caffeine intake in the afternoon so that your body is able to relax and calm down enough for you to quiet that system and get a restful night's sleep. 
different types of tea have different levels of caffeine. So even if you're like, I can't drink coffee, you know, post dinner because I'm going to be up all night or I can't drink, you know, black tea, maybe you should go towards a different type of tea that would make it easier for you to calm down like a chamomile, chamomile, chamomile. I never know how to pronounce that. Uh, herbal teas typically have very little caffeine, if any. Um, herbal teas, fruit teas, they typically don't have um, a lot of caffeine. Sometimes green, green tea, it does have some caffeine, but not as much as the black teas. I think white tea has reduced caffeine. So pay attention to what you're drinking. If it's not alcohol, that's great. And I'm not saying you can't ever drink alcohol, but keep it to like one glass or one bottle because that's going to interfere with your sleep cycle less than if you have multiple bottles or multiple glasses of alcohol before bed. Watch your caffeine consum consumption. Tea, coffee, chocolate. <laughs> if you're having one small square of chocolate as a dessert after food you know, and you wait three hours before you go to bed, you're probably not going to experience a challenge with sleeping. But um, some of us, again, are more sensitive to caffeine than others. <clears throat> so you can go to those um, decaffeinated options, decaf coffee, herbal teas, fruit teas. I will put a disclaimer out there if you're a nursing mom, avoid the mint tea. A lot of people say, oh, mint tea, it's, it feels fresh and kind of reminds you of brushing your teeth. It might help calm you down for before bedtime, but not a good idea if you're nursing or breastfeeding because mint can interfere with your body's ability to produce milk which you may or may not be aware of. But um, just putting that disclaimer out there, if you are a nursing mom and your baby's still waking up at night to drink milk, then you might want to avoid the mint tea before bed because even though it's calming, it doesn't have caffeine, it interferes with lactation. So just want to throw that out there. So now that we know some foods and some drinks that interfere with our body's ability to rest and calm down so we can get a proper night's sleep, let's talk about some foods that might help us fall asleep. Uh, you've probably heard that milk can be very good. So if you have um, turmeric milk before you go to bed, milk has some properties that might actually make it easier for you to fall asleep and feel sleepy. So hot chocolate, light on the caffeine for the, uh, the chocolate portion of that. There is caffeine in hot chocolate, but not as much as some other drinks you could be having. Um, you could have turmeric milk, which is basically milk with cinnamon and turmeric in it. You could do it a non-dairy version, but if you do do a non-dairy version of turmeric milk, be aware that um, almond milk, rice milk, other types of non-dairy milk don't have the same properties as dairy milk, so will not make you calm down the same way that dairy milk will. So if you're lactose intolerant, this may not be a solution for you, but it is a solution for those who can drink milk. Milk has been shown to make it easier for your body to relax. Other things that could help you with sleeping, tart cherry juice. Tart cherry juice is an interesting one because like its name implies, it's tart. So you may not want to drink something that makes you pucker up before bed. Or maybe it does make you want to pucker up before bed because when you do all that, there might be some other activities you can do that can help you get a good night's sleep. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, um, tart cherry juice is sold in most stores. Try to get the one that is not loaded with sugar. You can get some that are pure tart cherries, and it is, it's, it's something. You don't have to drink a full glass of it to get the effects of it, but it does help calm your body down. There's some properties in it that help you with that. So tart cherry juice is an option for you to help you calm down for bedtime. Milk is another one. Um, anything with tryptophan. <laughs> Turkey. Protein, <clears throat> by the way, excuse me, if you are hungry at night, and you might be if you're on a diet or you're trying to improve how you eat, you might be eating less throughout the day and find yourself hungry at night. That's okay to eat something at night. I'm not one of those people who's going to be like, don't eat before bed or don't eat after 6 p.m. You eat when you're hungry. Because don't go to bed hungry, it's going to be harder for you to fall asleep. So if you want to eat a snack before bed, the best bet for one that's not going to keep you up is protein. Something with protein in it. So especially knowing that milk has a, a certain calming and soothing effect on you, maybe a piece of string cheese, maybe some turkey, because tryptophan helps you sleep better too. 
you might um, wait a little bit longer for the effects of tryptophan than you would from milk or um, tart cherry juice, but you know those are options for you. Having a protein-based snack before bedtime is not as heavy as a fat-based snack. And as it's not as calorie caloric ridden, calorie ridden, as something that's highly carbs. So you know, a protein snack before bed is a good idea. And they have lots. Of, if you're not, um, if you don't do dairy and you don't eat meat, which some people don't, there are very really good snacks out there that are high protein from pea protein. And um, if you're vegetarian or vegan, you're probably familiar with some of these products. I found some chips that are made with pea protein. They're pr quite tasty. They're a little spicy, so spice may not be the best thing before you lay your head down to sleep. You might get acid reflux. But there are plenty of high-protein snacks out there that are um, fortified or infused with pea protein and uh, vegan sources of protein. So rest assured, there are plenty of protein-rich snacks, whether you're, no matter what it is you're eating, that can help you have a more restful night's sleep. What about if you really struggle with sleep and food is not going to do it and drinks are not going to do it because you already know all of that and you've already been implementing all of that. I'd like to talk about another option, which is natural. And um, I'm not saying that everything that's natural is good for you because that's not true at all. The opiate, the opium plant is natural. Like uh, <laughs> cannabis is natural. It doesn't mean it's good for everyone or good for every situation. However, if you can default to a natural solution as opposed to a med medicinal solution, I feel that that's a good step in the right direction. You don't want to add medicines to your body if you're already struggling with chemical reactions. And when I say chemical reactions, if you are not able to fall asleep or remain asleep for an extended period of time, there might be some chemical reactions going on in your body which are interfering with your ability to function that way. So if you can introduce a natural solution, that might be the first step for you and the right first step. Some natural solutions that might be helpful for you to get a good night's sleep would be melatonin. And this is something you can get in pill form, in gummy form, in tea form, at pretty much any co-op or store. You'd have to look in the, um, I believe it's in the, um, the vitamin aisle. So if that's what you're really looking for, um, I think depending on what version of it you take, whether you take the liquid form, the tea form, the gummy form, the pill form, I think they require you to take a certain milligram amount or something like that. And it's different for children than it is for adults. So if you sleep okay, but you have a child who doesn't sleep so well, rest assured that it is safe for children. You might want to test it out first to make sure that it works for your child, because again, every child is different. And it might be a better solution than trying to put, knock yourself out with Benadryl or something else like that, or knock your child out if they're having trouble sleeping. So I have personally taken melatonin before. I have given it to my daughter who has insomnia. And it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Now, it can be habit forming in the sense that um, after you take it for a continuous amount of time, it may not work for you as well. Some people also take valerian root. I haven't used that personally, and I don't know the research studies out there, but some people say it has been helpful for them. It is a natural solution. It's from a root. It's from a plant. Um, I don't know the dosage on that. And again, it's not a dosage because it's not a medicine. But I do know that it has certain um, interactions with other things. So especially if you're on prescriptions or some other medicines, you might want to double check warnings for taking valerian because it may not be the right solution for you. But those are two natural ways to get a better night's sleep. If you already know the food thing, you already know the, the liquid thing, and you're like, uh, I need something better than that. I'm going to go for another five minutes, but I want to introduce something that's very, very helpful. So maybe you're like, okay, well, it's not food, it's not drink, I don't want to take supplements, whatever, even if they're natural. What else can I do? This is going to be radical for some of you, so stick with me here. One thing you could do, which will have probably the biggest impact on your quality of sleep, hands down, the biggest impact on your quality of sleep is affected by blue light. What does that mean? Blue light comes from your computer. It comes from your TV. It comes from your phone. It comes from your tablet if you read books on your tablet. It comes from alarm clocks sometimes. Not every alarm clock is blue light driven, but usually. Anything that has a screen 
or a light display has blue light in it. Some light bulbs have blue light in them. Here's the problem with this. Your bedroom should be your sanctuary. And you can't have a sanctuary with a bunch of blue light all over the place because blue light works on our brains just like sunlight does. It tells us to wake up. It tells us to get moving. It tells us to start our day. And that is not the sanctuary, the sleep sanctuary you need in order to get a good night's sleep. So I, and I have my computer in my room. This is my bedroom. However, I turn off my display and I close my computer. There is no blue light coming out through there. I, um, I don't have my phone in my room ever. I will never have my phone in my room. For one thing, it makes a lot of noise from notifications. I don't turn off my notifications. I ignore it. And I keep it in the other room to charge it. It's not a good idea to keep your phone next to your bed. It's not a good idea to have that be the last thing you do when you go to bed and the first thing you do when you get up. That is interfering with your brain waves. It's called EMFs, and there are studies out there that are showing the impact of these EMFs. So if that's something that you consistently do right now, the best thing you can do is keep your phone out of your bedroom. It doesn't belong there. Now, I'm not going to be right, radical enough to tell you to take your TV out of your room because I know a lot of people who fall asleep to a TV. What I can say is if you have a TV in your room and you refuse to make it dark before you go to bed, ideally the half an hour before you uh, lay your head down on the pillow, you can please set a timer so that that blue light turns off from the TV and so it's not interfering with your body's ability to go through your sleep cycles. Blue light tells us to wake up. So turn off the devices, make them dark. Don't have any of that light facing your bed. So in a pinch, if you can turn your TV away from your bed, please do because that's helpful. Put a sleep timer on, put something on, a timer on so you can't do that. If you have an alarm clock that has a light display, consider shifting to an alarm clock that has hands on it because there's no light that's emitted from that one unless you press the button to light up the display. Consider that. If that's not an option for you, turn the display away from your bed so you cannot see the light when you wake up. We do tend to wake up throughout the night as humans because we have sleep cycles. So even if you're sleeping comfortably and well and feel rested in the morning, you still wake up at night and it's okay. That's natural. But if you wake up and you have three or four different kinds of blue lights flashing at you, it will cue your brain to wake up. And that's not how you get back to sleep comfortably. Another thing you can do, um, once you've removed all the blue light in your room or removed it from your line of sight, if nothing else, you can replace some of your bulbs in your room or lights or lamps in your room with red light. Because back from our caveman days, we had campfires, right? That was our only source of light. So we biologically rest and relax when there's red or orange tones around us. We are able to sleep to those lights. We're not able to do that with blue light because blue light didn't exist once upon a time and it reminds us too much of sunlight. So if you are able to, you can buy red light bulbs or orange salt lamps at the store and they're not too expensive. It can make a huge difference in terms of how you rest and how you relax at night. Also, I want to say that if you're like, I can't give up my phone before bed because I read on my, um, I have a Kindle on there and I read books at night and then I lay it down and I go to sleep. That's cool. Install an app um, or change the settings on your phone. So some of, sometimes this is a setting on your phone and if it's your computer, or a tablet, sometimes it's an app. It's called uh, Flux, F-L-U dot X, for a computer or maybe a tablet. It will reduce the blue light emission from your tablet or device. Same thing is true for your phone. It's in your settings. You can set, um, and I think it's under general settings. You're gonna have to explore a little bit because it's different for iPhone versus Android. But take a look at your phone settings. You can actually set a timer so that after a certain time of night, like 8 o'clock, 7.30, whatever, you can set whatever time, but it'll put a filter so that there's less blue light emitting from your tablet or, or phone or device. So if you absolutely must do your reading on your phone because you're in your bed, 
at least remove that blue light using an app or your phone settings because that's going to improve the quality of your sleep. That is what I have for you today. If you found this video helpful in terms of how to get a better night's sleep, because I am passionate about you getting the proper amount of sleep, you cannot focus and prioritize on your health without getting a foundation of proper sleep. It's just impossible. You will be less motivated to do it. You will be less energized to do it. And you'll be less likely to want to do other healthy habits like exercise and um, prep some healthy food for yourself. If you're tired and cranky and irritable from lack of sleep, you're not going to be able to implement other healthy changes in your life. So if nothing else, please implement one of the tips I talked about today. If you care to share, make sure you pop below in the comments and tell me which tip you're most excited to implement. And then don't forget to click share on this video and share it with your network because the biggest gift we can give to other people is the gift of more sleep, right? That is what I believe personally. Uh, in the meanwhile, make sure you join me next Friday at 9.30 Central Time. That's CST, 9.30 a.m. It's going to be in the morning. We're going to start our series, which is all about self-love. And if you're someone who would like additional accountability around that, I, am, I have opened the doors for my 30 days accountability program. So if you're like, what is this 30 days thing? Comment below with 30 days and I will connect with you and share more details. I don't have a sales page. I'm just kind of talking to people about this, I'm talking to you about this right now. But we create daily consistency around something that matters. You could choose to implement the sleep tips that we talked about for January and make that your 30 days for February. We will have a theme for February around self-love. So if you're someone who's had a, a, a broad history of health programs in your past and none of them have worked for you and you're so frustrated, you feel like you're destined to be where you are, you feel like nothing's ever going to change for you, 30 days is the right program for you and I'd love to talk to you about that. Comment below with 30 days if you're curious about learning more about that. Or stick around on this page because I will be sharing more about that program throughout the course of this weekend. Um, the doors will be closing February 6th. So if you want to have a phone call with me, I'll pop my link to schedule that phone call. Let's have a conversation. It may not be the right program for you, but I want you to be sure that you have the right support you need for what you want to accomplish for Heart Health Month in February. This is Jen Espinosa Goswami coming to you from Weightless. Make sure that you get a good night's sleep and share this video with everyone you know and consider the 30 days program for yourself so you can create daily consistency around something that makes a difference in your health. Thank you for joining me. Have a beautiful weekend.